Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Melissa Siegel and I'm a professor of migration studies and this is a channel about all things migration. And what we're going to do today is continue with our country study series where we focus in on one specific country, looking at the hist migration history, the policy situation, and the current mo modern day situation in the country. And right now I'm going to turn directly to the modern trends in Singapore. So if you haven't already, check out the video on the history of migration in Singapore and also the policy situation. But now let's get right to the modern day situation in Singapore. So Singapore is really characterized by very high rates of immigration in the country. In 2019, almost 40% of the population was born outside of the country. And the top countries of migrant origin are Malaysia, China, other South Asian countries, and particularly Indonesia. There's a high female participation rate in the workforce and an aging population that has led to an increase in the, in the demand for foreign domestic workers. And there have been a lot of foreign domestic workers that have been brought in from outside of the country. The majority, of course, of these foreign domestic workers are female. So there's a large portion of female foreign workers in the country. And there's been a large increase also in visa liberalization policies for highly skilled migrants. If you check out the previous video on policies, you'll see that there are a lot of really preferential policies for highly skilled migrants in the country. Now, Singapore also doesn't differentiate between the foreign born or the lo locally born population in its demographic, in its demographic statistics but you can see that there are quite a few. There's a sizable population of foreigners that are granted also citizenship and permanent residency status each year, which you can see here in, in this graph. And with an po overall population of 5.7 million in 2019, it means that there's an estimated 1% growth in re the resident population each year due to naturalization and granting of permanent residency status. There are actually more female migrants in Singapore than male migrants. And this has this really hit a peak in 2015 and leveled off again in 2019. But it's interesting that Singapore is one of the few countries that has more female immigrants than male immigrants. And again, part of this is really linked to the need for domestic workers in the country. Now, with regard to labor migration, currently more than a third of the country's labor force was born outside of the country. Low-skilled migrants consist of around almost 85% of the total foreign work, workforce population in 2019, even though there's such a focus from a policy perspective on highly skilled migrants. There's an increasing number of foreign domestic worker permit holders and a decreasing number of construction work permit holders between 2014 and 2019. The relatively liberal policies for attracting highly skilled migrants since, 20, since 1990 transitioned and helped to transition a knowledge-based economy and you're seeing more and more a push for highly skilled migrants. But the, there's also been a key integration of highly skilled migrants into key managerial positions across banks, research institutes, and many other areas within the country. You can also see here the number of permits and the percent of total and the percent of the total foreign workforce over time. So you can see that a high number of work permits are being uh, are being issued, and this has also changed over time. There are then also the employment passes. So again, the employment passes are those who are the highly skilled and the work permits are for not highly skilled groups here. I think that's important to understand. So the percentage of work permit holders or low skilled migrants as part of the total foreign work par workforce population has been decreasing in part, uh, in part because of the effort to decrease the dependency on foreign labor in this area. On the other hand, the percentage of employment pass holders or the highly skilled migrants has increased. So again, for more on these differences in these visa types, see the video on migration policies in the country. 
So Singapore is a main remittance sending country to Southeast Asia. If you'd like to learn more about remittances, so the money that migrants send back to their families in their origin countries, you can check that video that's linked up above. There are several videos on the channel with regard to remittances, so do check those out if you're interested. So Singapore sent uh, $625 billion in remittances in 2017. So for the size of the country, that is really a substantial amount of remittances that are being sent to many other countries. So here, if we look at information from uh, the Pew Research Center the World, and the World Bank, we can see the top countries where remittances are being sent. So this is China, Malaysia, India, Pakistan, Indonesia, Bangladesh, Thailand, the Philippines, Philippines, Sri Lanka, and Australia as the major destinations for the remittances that are being sent from Singapore. Now, if we look at the integration of migrants or specifically lower skilled migrants, there are two main types of lower skilled migrants currently in Singapore today. These are the foreign domestic workers and the work permit holders. These are more considered more transient workers, so those who are not going to stay and settle in the country, they also really have no path to being able to settle in the country. Work permit holders are not allowed family re reunification and they cannot apply for permanent residency. As I said before, unlike the S pass holders or the employment pass holders. So medium skilled and higher skilled uh, migrants in Singapore do have these rights, but the lower skilled migrants do not. In 2009, the National Integration Council was set up to integrate immigrants from um, using a function integration, socialization and building of mutual trust act. In 2019, the Institute of Policy Studies in Singapore showed that one out of every six citizens thinks that immigrants are not doing enough to integrate. So of course this shows some concern in the country for the integration of migrants. Of course there are social challenges faced by immigrants in integration with regard to languages and difficulties to break into social networks. And physical segregation is quite common in the country as most labor migrants, especially um, in construction or in the maritime shipyards or are in dormitories and the domestic workers live and work in their employers' houses. So there's a lot of just practical segregation where these groups are not really able to physically integrate in many regards in the country. This gives an example just of where some of these dormitories are in the country where they're located and there are very specific situations also of these groups which we'll come back to later. There is very much the, a precarity of employment and living conditions for foreign domestic workers. They're usually hired through domestic helper agencies or kind of maids agencies. In 2013, foreign domestic workers were entitled to one weekly rest day, which can be compensated with pay if she agrees to work on that day. So that actually means that they have to work at least six days a week and sometimes they're working seven days a week. Despite some origin countries requiring employers to purchase performance bond guarantees such as Indonesia, the Singaporean government has publicly stated that they do not require nor will they take action against employers who choose not to. So this means there aren't many safety nets for these foreign domestic workers. In 2018, the government strengthened the protection though for foreign domestic workers by making um, more severe punishments for some things that are not allowed. However, cases of work exploitation and giving foreign domestic workers inadequate food are still present in Singapore today. This is because foreign domestic workers usually live with their employers and it's often difficult to detect such abuses. Now, if we look at the precarity of the employment and live, of living and working conditions of the low skilled migrants or those that are work permit holders officially, these are the lower skilled migrants, mainly in labor intensive jobs. There is very often a fear and a vulnerability to repatriation. 10% of male lower skilled work permit holders report being threatened with repatriation by employers on a regular basis. 
In 2018, 35% of interviewed migrants say that they carry their own work permit or passport. That means that almost 62% of at least the migrants that were interviewed in this study had their passports kept by the employer despite that this is against the law. Um, and of course, this really is a power play in the country and it makes the migrants much more vulnerable if they don't have their own documents. It's also common for lower skilled migrants to begin employment in debt bondage with approximately up to one year's gross uh, earnings that need to be paid back before they can actually start earning their own salaries. These workers in general, not just those that might be in debt bondage, but in general, these lower skilled workers usually live in dormitories that are crowded and geographically segregated from the main residential areas. So you can also see some photos of, of the kinds of living conditions that they are in, which are uh, definitely not the kinds of living conditions of the average person in Singapore. So with regard to healthcare for lower skilled migrants, this is also a bit of a tricky subject. These lower skilled migrants are excluded from national healthcare subsidies and the employers are seen as gatekeepers to healthcare and responsible for the purchase of insurance fit is fitting the state requirements and reporting claims. So there is a mandatory private medical insurance, but there's a maximum compensation limit and it doesn't cover outpatient care. Um, and there's also a private work injury compensation insurance that also has a maximum amount, but whether or not employers are really held to this is not always clear. There is also the fear that sinking health care for acute health conditions will threaten their earning, their earning capacity in the country. So there are reasons why these lower skilled migrants also don't necessarily want to access health care when they might need it because they're worried about their earning possibilities at the same time. So nowadays thinking about the migration situation and health, I think it's really important to look at the effect of COVID-19 on especially these lower skilled migrants in Singapore. There were a number of outbreaks of COVID-19 in migrant dormitories across the country. And as you can see, people are really packed into these dormitories, which meant that exposure was extremely high and it was very easy to pass COVID-19 to each other. In, as of the 15th of December, 2020, 47% of all the dormitory dwellers had actually tested positive for COVID-19. In April of 2020, there was a lockdown of dormitories. There was extensive swabbing. Migrant workers weren't allowed to step out and food and essential services were, were, were brought in. So what you also see in Singapore is that the main outbreaks of COVID-19 were actually in dormitories because of the living conditions. So here you can see the difference in the number of cases in the general community compared to the number of cases in these dormitories. And the, the numbers are just vastly different. So the, the impact of COVID-19 has been quite great. They've been exposed to poor conditions in the migratory dormitories. There were minimum legal, the minimum legal requirement states that there must be 4.5 square meters of living space per worker, but nearly half of these dormitories breach these conditions every year. They're exposed to a lack of health care and insurance planning for lower skilled migrant workers. There are also, there have been further conflicts between locals and migrants. With, so for instance, Bangladeshi migrant workers have also sued their employers for confinement in a room for up to 43 hours. And uh, in April of 2020, the lar largest Chinese language newspaper in Singapore published a forum article that claimed that the high infection rates among, among migrants were due to the migrants' poor hygiene and lifestyle habits. So what you can already see here is that while the migrants were being forced to live in these very cramped conditions, some, uh, some local newspapers were blaming the migrants themselves for this situation. So there's really a high rate of vulnerability with not much being, with less being done to actually help that situation. So if we turn then to highly skilled migrants in general, uh, there are no integration programs required at all for highly skilled migrants. As I said before, there is really a push to try to attract more and more highly skilled migrants. 
Studies show that other than the workplace, there's also a lack of, of institution or shared spaces among highly skilled migrants and the local population. And as in other countries also, there is self-segregation in high-end co condominiums and in exclusive areas near city centers, which is very common. Um, and you do have these kinds of areas that are sort of almost expat villages in the country. As far as immigration is concerned or Singaporeans leaving the country, the increasing GDP and income growth and really the increasing development of Singapore has given the citizens of Singapore a much higher capacity and ability to be able to migrate. There's really a high mobility of Singaporeans. Um, uh, overseeing, at least registered overseas Singaporeans in 2019 were more than 200,000. The top destination countries for Singaporeans abroad are the United Kingdom, Malaysia, Australia, the United States, and Indonesia. And one of the main reasons that Singaporeans go abroad is for higher education. So one out of every 10 students that were in higher education in general were enrolled abroad from Singapore. So higher education, a really important reason for migrants to go abroad. And then of course, with those diaspora engagement policies that we've talked about previously, the government is also really trying to get those now very highly skilled Singaporeans to come back and contribute to, to Singapore. So I hope this gave you a quick an understanding of the current migration situation in Singapore. Again, if you haven't done so already, check out the migration history in Singapore and also the migration policies in Singapore. If you're interested in many of the other countries that we've looked at, please check out the other videos in the YouTube channel where we look at a number of other country case studies with more uh, videos coming out every week. So I hope this was helpful. If you liked it, Please like, subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell, and I definitely hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.